sure you can see my uh, my screen now. Yep. Uh, Azure Machine Learning up. Yep, it looks okay, good. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right, good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Mike Ree, I'm a BI consultant with Pragmatic Works. Been there a year and a half. Um, spent a couple of years here in Jacksonville, Florida, working for a uh, uh, healthcare payment processor. Spent six years at Microsoft in the uh, online services behavioral targeting group prior to that and the rest of it probably doesn't matter outside of the fact I have a whole lot of years as a uh, uh, partner in a business which is where my interest in big data and really the use of big data comes from. <coughs> Excuse me, getting over a little bit of a cold. So I expect you'll be thrilled to know I have a total of two slides today, one you're looking at and one at the very end. So we're going to talk about Azure Machine Learning, um, the whole uh, the uh, analytics platform, data mining uh, component of the Azure uh, ecosystem. Let me kill this PowerPoint real quick. And we will come back to this later. So let me show you quick images here. <clears throat> so off in the middle of, of uh, uh, this new Azure uh, module is our machine learning uh, environment. So you should understand that this is about three quarters of the way through the whole data science uh, uh, methodology. And this is very definitely data science. This is um, something if you're, if you're going to spend much time with this, you're going to have to learn about data science and the process behind it and how it works and <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. Um, it's going to be important to know that, you know, to understand what these uh, uh, what all these models are and what all these things do and how this whole process works, which is what I'm going to talk to you today. Um, and I'm not going to do it, but I'll do it with this particular example in some detail. Um, it'll give you a pretty good uh, place to start from. So in that this is three quarters of the way through, um, let's talk about the dependencies here. So every every experiment uh, needs data. So where does that come from? Um, you can, in this environment, you can pull it in directly by using uh, data readers. You can pull it in uh, But you can pull in from websites, you can use save data sets, you can pull the data sets in and save them to your own library, you can use the, the uh, Microsoft Experiment Library, all the lab libraries. Um, or you can process this data somewhere else. Um, you can certainly use uh, your HD Insight, use uh, uh, HivePig, everything else over on, on the HD Insight side, um, understanding that that uh, you'll be reading in from a file and writing out to a file, and you'll be putting that file <clears throat> somewhere, probably on, uh, on uh, Azure Storage um, as a blog. So let me go back here real quick. So The uh, machine learning uh, readers can reach out to any storage that you have set up in uh, in Azure. So let's talk a little bit about this whole Azure platform. For anybody that doesn't understand what it is, it's a it's a giant ecosystem of uh, it's a platform for managing, creating, managing uh, machines, networking, etc. There are at a uh, couple of images here for you. So <clears throat> as a as a service, so there's platform as an it as uh, uh, as infrastructure, platform as service. Um, Azure offers a, a variety of, of uh, options for building out machines, for spinning up SQL servers, for spinning up web web servers. Um, and they manage it through uh, this uh, larger set of services than this, but this is pretty much you know, is trying to give you some idea that it's, it's not just, okay, it's a machine here, a machine there, virtual machines, of course. Um, and of course, they are scattered or can be scattered all over the, all over the planet. Um, yes, this is fuzzy, but it's really just to give you some idea of, of 
uh, how much effort uh, Microsoft has put into this whole Azure thing. Uh, not all of these in, uh, locations are available for HD Insight, and not all of them are available for Azure Machine Learning. Um, again, that, that's changing very rapidly. This machine learning module is, is pretty new, so you can expect a lot of changes uh, real certainly over the coming months and years. So the whole, the whole data science process um, starts with getting and cleaning data. So where, are we get, where do we get it? Um, actually, it starts with identifying a question to be answered. And then from there, um, figuring out what data you need, what data you have, what data you can, you can collect to augment your, your analysis. Um, the more varied your data, uh, the the better your predictions are likely to be. That doesn't necessarily mean that, that if you do an analysis over 300 variables, um, you're going to get a better prediction because a lot of those variables could be uh, could be noise or they could actually be detrimental. We'll talk about that in a little bit. For for this exercise, um, I'm using a, uh, a flight data data set. It is um, looks like this. Um, it's already cleaned up for us, mostly. Um, there are a few things that we need to do for the uh, for the algorithm that we're going to run, but for the most part it's already converted into uh, you know, nice neat looking columns and, and you know, well-defined uh, well variables and limits and data types, that sort of thing. However, it's not exactly what we need and we'll probably find some things in here that, that are really nothing but noise. The idea with the noise is that any any variable in here that if it's not uh, what we'll call categorical, if it's if it has low granularity, if there's two values in here across uh, say a hundred thousand rows, and it's not a, a you know a boolean, then that column is probably just going to to distract the algorithm. It's probably just going to be noise. Um, Cases where everything is is the same. Cases where you might have uh, nulls in important places in here. Um, you may you may choose to get rid of those. In most cases, you would. Um, if you have nulls in particular columns or particular variables uh, in the data science world, you would need to decide what to do with those. Whether you leave them at zero. Um, in many cases, uh, you'll see your practice of adding one to everything, such that you move uh, all the zeros away from zero, and, and that leaves you know, empties as empties, and you can then distinguish between them and convert your empties to, to zeros at that point. <clears throat> um, you may choose to uh, pick on, uh, you know, put something else in here. Um, in this case, you know, a delay, you might choose nearest neighbors. Um, so you select some, you know, ten nearest neighbors, the average of, or the median of, or mean of uh, uh, the neighbors around it. Um, a lot of this, it, again, if you're going to do this, a lot of this is is truly based on data science, and I should probably throw a, a short disclaimer out here. So I've I've been enrolled in a Coursera program, uh, data science uh, specialization through Johns Hopkins for the last nine months. We're just starting our capstone project. It's another two, so it'll be almost a year. Prior to that, I had little experience with uh, with data science in general. Um, some with statistics and analytics a little bit, but but not a whole lot. So what I'm what I'm repeating here today is a lot of what I've learned over those months and. And quite frankly, if you're going to if you're going to be involved in this area, you're going to have to spend a little time in here, um, learning something about data science and understanding the whole process. In that, a lot of these decisions. Well, if I change, you know, if I use a if I change a zero or null to a, to an average, um, how does that impact my data? As a as a you know matter of course, that's something that you would you would test during the during the execution, um, and these these things are called experiments for a reason because they are. You know, it's not, nothing in here is is totally concrete. It's all about probabilities, and it's all about what you do to your data and 
how reliable that data is and the impact of what you did to that data to get it to the point that you can actually run an algorithm against it. And you may need to run many, many uh, iterations to figure out that you've got whether you've got really a, a good model or not. So flight delay data um, looks like this. We're also using a, uh, a uh, weather data. Um, we're combining the two in here. So we have something about uh, for the particular locales, we have uh, hourly weather observations. So we'll be looking at both of those in this, uh, in this model. So let's just, let's just dive into it. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to build a model that says, okay, I can, I can feed this model. Um, once this model is published, I can give it a set of data, um, a set of variables that would be location, weather, et cetera, and it will come back and, and predict whether, um, you know, whether that flight is likely to be delayed or not, and <clears throat> what the probability of it being delayed is. So, we're using a set, a data set that's already uh, cleaned up for us. Um, it's a whole nother, um, uh, well, I can't do it in an hour. I can't go through the whole uh, pulling the data in and cleaning it all up. Um, there is some manipulation in here that we'll do, but it's, uh, if I were to start from, say, a Twitter, raw Twitter feed data, um, we could not cover that in an hour. And if, uh, if anybody's interested, please throw a comment in and your uh, responses at the end of this webinar, and I'll look at actually doing a, an hour on uh, getting and cleaning data, and we'll use uh, Hive Big HD Insight, to a whole, uh, whole nine yards to actually prep this data and push it into storage, and then we could go ahead and build a model on it. So for now, we're going to use uh, this flight data. Um, it is in here as a safe data set. So we have our flight data and our weather data. So these are both uh, CSV files. Um, the way this environment works, um, it's a drag and drop. So I can I can pull anything I want in here, and I can immediately look at it. You can right click, hit the visualization, and it gives you it'll show you what everything uh, uh, what the data set itself looks like. Um, In our case, we have uh, we've seen our flight data. So here's what it looks like here. I won't turn to it again. So, but it, these are both uh, CSV files. So we need to convert those to a data set, which is the the format that uh, Azure Machine Learning use inter uses internally. Um, I presume it would be the equivalent in in uh, R, the language for it. Uh, large percentage of data scientists uh, use uh, a data frame. So all this does is con converts it to a, a data set. Um, here we're projecting columns, so we don't really need all of those columns that we get. So um, we're, going to, we're going to choose which ones we want to keep and which ones we want to lose, and we do that by launching this column selector um, we start with all columns, as you see here, and then we're choosing to exclude this, these particular uh, columns. The deal here is that we don't want to actually predict on, the, on uh, these columns. They're, they appear to be of, of little value. Um, year, everything is for the same year, so it does nothing but adds another variable in there to uh, more or less distract the, the algorithm. So, we use that to project our columns and remove those. We can, again, anywhere in here, you can see um, what we've done and what we've removed. So you can look at this all the way through and see what our, uh, see what our data set looks like. Um, here we've decided we need to uh, uh, change a change data type. So we have, we have a couple of columns in here, a couple of variables, sorry, uh, data science language. We have a couple of variables. Carrier, carrier, origin airport, destination airport, that are numeric. Um, and as a numeric value, um, the algorithm will assume that it's a continuous numeric variable unless we tell it otherwise. 
systems. So airport IDs are certainly not continuous. Um, it's a discrete set of uh, uh, categorical data, same with destination, same with carrier. So what we're doing in here is we're changing these types to categorical for these columns. In our uh, math operation, we are, oops, sorry about that, screw that up. So we're interested, a little bit of, we'll back up and talk about it a little bit. We're going to join this data with our weather data, and we're going to join it um, by location and time. Um, as you might guess, we can't join, you know, 416, 2302 um, to our weather observation because they probably don't have a weather observation for that particular time. And rather than try to manufacture a lot of values, we're going to just back everything off to hours. So here we're multiplying by 100, sorry, we're dividing by 100, which reduces our hours. Um, turns it to a uh, decimal with the hour as the uh, as the whole number can, can do it. Yeah, maybe not. I'm not going to wait. All right, maybe I'm going to wait. We seem to be stuck here for a moment. Oh, that's not good. All righty. Um, and here we are, um, sorry, here we're actually doing our join. So let's back up here to our weather data set real quick. So we divided by an hour here. Um, and this next step, we've gone with the four, so we're rounding down for our, for our flight data. So we're rounding to a prior hour. In our weather set, we're doing something similar, uh, convert to a data set, um, we throw out some columns here. Um, here's this is a little bit different. What are we doing with our uh, missing values? So we've decided to, for missing values, we're going to remove the entire row. Um, we will not have an observation for, potentially not have an observation for some hours. Um, the algorithm will deal with that all right. We are, we'll deal with that in the join actually. So um, columns with uh, all values we keep, we're not, uh, we're not generating anything, we're just removing those, those values. Here we are doing the same thing. We're dividing by 100 for the hours. And here we're going with ceiling instead. So we're moving our weather to the next hour and we moved our flight to the previous hour nearest previous hour. So the idea there is that we will always use uh, weather prediction that comes after the time, after the hour of the flight schedule. So we join these, um, nothing special here, month, day, um, it's just like your standard joins. Um, Excuse me. I wish I could get rid of this thing. It's kind of obnoxious. I don't know what's going to happen if I refresh my screen. Yay. All right. So let's try this again. So we are subtracting. We're adjusting. Why does it keep doing that? Here we're adjusting for, let's show you this real quick. So our weather is all in Zulu, Greenwich Mean Time, and our, just doesn't want to show me that stuff, our flight data is in local time. So what this is doing, and it's not going to show it to me, is we're just subtracting the, the uh, time zone offset from our hours to put the hours, uh, you know, give us a common uh, uh, common time zone, which is, again, Zulu, Central Greenwich Mean Time, 
um, whatever you want to call it. And then we are joining our sets back together again. So we have our we have our uh, departure times and our uh, arrival times both in our data set now. And the first piece of the real data science um, is we have to split our data. So we take our entire data set and we divide it up into pieces. We will use a piece to as a training data set, and that's what we use to train our model on. Um, we'll take another piece of it and we'll use it to validate our data. And we'll use another piece to, um, actually I think we're using two here. So we're using a training and test data set. So we're splitting it in two pieces. In this case, I believe it's a 25% split. Oops, splitting on month. So we're using all of the months prior to October as our training data. So we'll use that to actually run our model against and and figure out what uh, what values to use in the in the model. And we'll use our current data, which will be October, our last month of this data set, as our test data set. What we do in this process is we do all of our training on this on this you know, prior to uh, October set. And we, we train this model until we get the best results we possibly can. And then we come back and we run our, our test set um, against that model to see how it, how it actually lines up. So during this whole process, we're, we actually have our outcomes. We know whether the flights were delayed or not. Um, there's, no, there's no guesswork here uh, from that standpoint. But that does give us the ability to say, okay, in our training set, we will use you know, this combination of, of weather patterns and, and carriers and locations, uh, departure destination locations, results in a, a probability of, of a delay where some, uh, you know, another set might not. Um, and we use that then, to, uh, we use those, those known outcomes to, um, to actually train this model. So we then take our test data and we ignore that, that uh, uh, those known outcomes when we actually do the prediction using that, that uh, test data. But then we compare the prediction to the known values that are in that data and that gives us our accuracy, our precision and accuracy scores. Now in a, once, once you you know, deploy this this uh, model and and start using it elsewhere. You will obviously not have the known outcome. You'll just pass it a set of data that looks you know, looks a row of data or uh, that looks exactly like our our input flight data and possibly our weather data if it's not current. <clears throat> and it will predict you know without having that. Uh, without having those known outputs. So we take the knowns, and this goes back to something I've, I've mentioned in a lot of my webinars about baseline. Uh, no matter what you're doing, you need a baseline, and you need to record outcomes. If you're, if you're talking about uh, you want to do some analysis on, uh, on your machines, on your operations, you need to record all of the variables that you can while, while that equipment is running, the people are working, the processes are moving. But you also need to record um, an outcome. You know, is everything happy? Is is you know, is the system healthy or not? Or the, is the uh, product being delivered within uh, you know with the rate you're expecting or not? You need that. You need that outcome in your data so you can come back and train your models to say, okay, this is good. This is not. Because without that baseline, uh, you really don't have much to go with. So something to uh, consider in, in all of your data collection is to make sure that you know whether whether life is good or not at a particular time and that's recorded along with the data. So we are now down to we split our data. We're now going to actually collect a model 
Um, in this case, again, uh, all this stuff is, this is all experimental. So best practice says we will try, we'll make a best guess at what type of uh, algorithm to run, and we will probably run more than one, you know, until we decide on, uh, on which one is best. And it, it's possible, you know, there's certainly discussion in a lot of uh, practice where many models are used and they are, the output is, is aggregated to give us a, a more durable, uh, uh, more durable and reliable, reliable outcome. So in this case, we're looking at uh, boosted decision trees, and we have another one that's simple logistic regression. Um, so decision tree says, you know, if this, then this, and if these values, then split into this, you know, into another pair of uh, branches, and then it looks and says, okay, so if if at these values, um, we'll split another branch, and at these values, we'll split another values for same or different variables. We'll split other branches. Uh, a linear regression actually takes uh, all of your data and plots the variables along points, and it will fit a line through them. It'll create a line uh, uh, with some slope, and it will then say, okay, that's the that's the average of, of all of these, or that's the that line most accurately describes our the the values of the variables that we have. So you may have a line with a uh, with a slope typically straight. You can, of course, different models you can make that curve. But uh, linear, we we'll call it a line, straight line. You'll have your variables, you know, variable values above and below some line probably. Um, the difference between your variable and that line is called your variance. You add your variances up, actually you square your variances and add those up, and then uh, uh, that's your total variation. And that's a, that's the you know, first step in uh, determining how accurate your model is. So what that says is that for any x along this slope, you can multiply it by this slope and that will give you a Y. So it gives you an easy way to actually do your predictions. It's a, it's a great place to start. That's where the uh, uh, Johns Hopkins course started you know, when we actually got around to uh, uh, data mining models so with that regression. is because it's you know, very much uh, one of the simplest there is. So we're going to, uh, we picked, we'll walk down this uh, boosted decision tree. Um, we pick this model, and we here we we have a sweep parameter uh, task. What this does is it it goes through the the variables we have to determine. It makes a guess at which ones are are best to use for the uh, or most influential in the prediction outcome. So. We give it our uh, we give it our data. We give it our uh, the output of our columns. Um, we have to split both. We have to uh, uh, pass them both in here for these these parameters. It needs the full set. So we then uh, pull this task in again. All this I don't know if I need to show you this. All this stuff is drag and drop. We can we can pull our models in, um, and we can do our uh, we can do our scoring. We can, you know, literally anything in here is very much like, you know, I think it's way more than SSIS in a lot of ways, but it's, it's very much a drag a model in and and hook things up to other things and maybe it'll let you do it, maybe not. It's, it's smart enough to know whether you can uh, you can do this or not. Descriptive statistics will literally just tell us, you know, mean max or mean, min max mean, uh, standard deviation, that sort of thing. So everything in here is, is drag and drop. So it's really pretty nice from that standpoint. Um, it kind of belies the uh, the complexity of what's going under on underneath the uh, underneath the covers here. So we uh, run the sweep parameters. It it makes a determination as to which variables are are most likely uh, most influential. Um, in 
say in R, we would do very much the same thing. Um, that, that likelihood you may you may use that data here. I can't interact with it in between, but I might use that data to say you know these two or three of the the variables are really determining you know ninety percent of the accuracy, and you know, the rest of it is just noise. If our data set was huge, we would need to trim down everything we possibly can, and you know, without impacting our causing our prediction to become uh, usable, unusable rather. So there's the concept here of, of uh, uh, null hypothesis testing. And what we're really after is something that will give us a better result than essentially a coin toss. That's what it comes down to in almost all cases. So we run our, uh, we score our model. And so this, uh, uh, Completes the completes the training, and once we're done with that, um, we can. We're here. We're outputting our columns. Data looks like scored data set looks like looks like this. We now have a couple of extra columns in here. Scored labels and scored probabilities, which were added by the. Uh, Headed by the algorithm, and now we're joining back to, uh, you know, for the purpose of uh, actually reducing some of the columns, and now we're joining back to the airport codes data set. So we, at this point, will have actual airport codes. So we have real life names instead of uh, uh, instead of just the numbers. So for the humans in the group, that makes life a little easier. Oops. And that's pretty much it down that tree. Let's go over and look at the logistic regression. So same story. We choose a, a logistic regression model. Um, run the sweep again. We score the model. Data looks a little bit different over here. So here again, we have uh, uh, labels and probabilities. You know, for these particular uh, uh, sets of variables, um, these are probabilities of, uh, of being late. So it looks like all of them are fairly low, some of them are not quite so low. And again, we are filtering our columns. Uh, same story, we're removing some of them. So we're getting rid of everything that really doesn't mean much to us, taking out all the IDs and such. And then we're joining back for the humans and making it a little easier to look at. Um, we do here in the middle, since we've run these two models, um, we have the ability to uh, do an evaluation. We're going to compare the two models. So what this uh, says for our, our, uh, our, our two rates, our two models, is that there's not a lot of difference. Both of them are, you know, Accuracy 80%, um, not bad. You know, it's you know that's a lot of margin error. Well, there's a 20% chance it'll be wrong. So more often than not, I guess that's. I don't know whether you would want to bet the farm on bet the farm on these numbers or or not. So um, so here we have a chance to look and see how the two models performed against each other and. We can then decide, you know, which model, if uh, which of the two we would uh, we would choose to use um, in a production environment. So from here, um, once you're once you're done with the model and you're going, okay, well now I need to productionize this thing. Um, first thing, save it, and second, we have to go back through and clean out everything. I'm not going to do this in here, but 
have to go back through and clean out everything except our our model, our incoming data, and any manipulation we did to it on the way in, these math operations and such, we would not be splitting our data anymore. So pretty much everything everything up here will be the same. We'll join, we will take this split out, and we will load this data directly into our uh, sweep parameters and we'll keep our score. Um, we may, if you want, um, leave the project columns, but we have the we have the ability now to set this as a published output. So the idea here is that we mark an output and why this behavior is always different. Um, we mark um, our output, we mark our Um, we mark our input. Uh, we have to go. See these will be here. Okay, so we mark our input. Um, any data that comes in would be applied at this point. Um, the reason we leave all of the other data there is to provide the. Uh, metadata about what that structure should look like so the model knows what to do with it. And then we uh, we publish this whole thing, um, we can publish it as a web service. So if we had back here, if I had any uh, websites up, um, which I could spin up pretty quickly, again I won't do that. Um, if we could spin up a website, we can then publish that web service and uh, that model is a web service, then we can access that, you know, make a call to it from, from any uh, uh, any interface that, you know, has, that will interact with the web service, pass a set of data in, and it will return a prediction based on, uh, uh, based on the training of this model. So that's, that's it in a, High level, kind of quick run through, sort of covered a whole lot of things in the in the data science piece, um, in the uh, data science methodology. So again, what it comes down to is, I, is start with identifying a problem, um, collect data that will support your analysis, go back to that data and. and um, Think about what it is you're trying to do, whether you're trying to build a recommendation engine, which we typically use some sort of association or clustering uh, algorithm, or whether you're trying to do a you know, simple prediction, which might use, again, a, a uh, you know, linear regression of some sort. Um, uh, whether you're using a, uh, you know, uh, purchase uh, prediction, uh, fraud prediction, all of these things are, you know, you really, have, this is where the, the education comes in. You need to understand um, what these algorithms do and what, uh, you know, what the data needs to look like for that. And that's, that's kind of explained in here. You can, you can pull a model in and you know, get a little bit of information about what this does, um, what it's expecting. Uh, but again, it's you know, this is this is kind of I don't want to say way off in the deep end of uh, of data science, but it's certainly it's certainly it's it's not like I'll say SSIS where you can you can say okay, I, I know what a uh, uh, you know, I know what a data transformation is, or I know what a null handler is, or you know, I know I know what all these tasks tasks do, and they're all they're all fairly simple. Um, these things are are not. You know, under the under the covers, um, you know, many of these are actually running. Um, they're doing a lot more than than just pushing data into a into a uh, formula. Uh, many of them, these these boosted decision trees, the uh, uh, decision forest. These actually will 
will take a, an algorithm, you can tell it what kind, or in some cases you can tell it you know, multiple kinds of algorithms. They will take your data and they will, based on defaults or user, you know, at least in the R language anyway, user inputs, um, you can tell it what to do with uh, how to how to train the model and, and so in many cases it will take a percentage of the data some some random uh, sampling again based on parameters that you've told it whether it it uh, divides everything into sets and iterates over the sets they may they may actually run through parts of your data or take a random set you know eighty percent random set and run that and then go back and take another 80% and run that and take another 80% you know, um, you know, of the same sample of course but each time you know changing the uh, uh, changing the set out and running it over and over and over again um, and then combining the results of that so a lot of them are, are really quite complex in what they in what they do behind the scenes uh, in the uh, I keep talking about the R language. If you're going to do much of this, you're, you're probably going to want to learn something about R. Um, there is support for R here, which is really kind of nice, but you know, we get one. There's not much, uh, not much help here. But the R language is uh, used by, I don't want to say most, I can't speak with authority on that, but it's been used for a long time for this very purpose. There are thousands of uh, R packages that are built to clean data, to manipulate data, to uh, uh, um, you know, different algorithms and, and packages that uh, one in particular, uh, uh, carrot C-A-R-E-T, that actually is one of those where I say, okay, I want to call this carrot function and I will give it a, give it a data set, I will give it a few parameters that says uh, what kind of algorithm I want to run. I'll tell it how many, uh, uh, how many iterations I want it to run over. A um, variety of other things I can pass into it. I can tell it to do predictions in the middle of it. I can tell it to, I mean, it's really crazy what you can, you know, the complexity of some of these things. But um, within in just a few lines of code, you can tell it to do some pretty amazing things. And one of those, actually, something we don't have here, is visualization. Um, you know, we have our very limited, you know, visualize here, but we don't really have a means of, of uh, providing graphs and plots and, and whatever, which we do in R. And we can implement some of that here. Um, I'm doing a, uh, for anyone interested, I'm doing a, a webinar next week on Tuesday where I'll take some of this data and I'll use the, uh, the Power BI uh, tools to actually visualize some of it uh, so we can actually see what we're doing. In the, in the normal course of business, if I were doing this in R, I would inspect my data, I would inspect my work um, all the way through. I would, I would you know, pull my data in, I would, I would you know, drop it into a uh, you run some statistics on it to see you know what what uh, you know what the grant the uh, cardinality is of all my variables. Um, again, I would look to see which ones you know, should be should be categorical versus you know continuous and, and you know, based on some of that. Then you know here comes the dangerous part: intuition. Um, I might choose to eliminate some of those variables. I might choose to eliminate some of the some of the observations. Um, observation is a row in the data science world, so we might choose to eliminate uh, observations entirely, or we might choose you know, if, it, if there are variables that uh, appear to be important, then we might go the other route and, and make some decisions on how to actually clean the data up and repair. Uh, uh, nulls, NANs, NAs and NANs, um, what, to, what to do with all of those. So lots of decisions to make and lots of, lots of things that you can do um, in here that would totally screw up your results or totally skew your results, let's put it that way. Um, 
you pull too much of the data out, you pull the wrong columns out, you leave too many columns in. You know, columns are, are totally uh, confusing. You know, if you leave your prediction uh, columns in, um, it's going to love those because those are you know, obviously tied to the prediction itself. So the things you do to your data on the way in um, is very important and as part of part of the uh, data science process, there's a uh, there's a uh, uh, concept of reproducible research and that implies that I can take a set of data, I can provide a set of documentation and I can hand that to anybody and they can run it and we'll get the same results. Which says that A, I can get the same result every time and B, that somebody else can as well. So that's a, uh, you know, it's just validation that, that what you've done is, is, is at least reproducible. It may not necessarily be correct. But in, uh, in today's world where everybody's talking to everybody, um, that's one of the real beauties of the whole data science uh, field, you know, that I'm obviously just learning about, is that everybody likes to share. You know, when everybody posts their models, uh, there's a, there's a uh, site, obviously, um, uh, we have GitHub. If you look out there, you'll see that there are a lot of R-based projects out on GitHub, a lot of algorithms, and most of them are public. If you look at a site called rpubs, rpubs.com, you'll see a lot of uh, a lot of work. It's it's uh, an R-based. It's a hosting site for R uh, analysis, R experiments. Um, a lot of the uh, Almost all the work that we've done in this uh, Coursera program is out there. But if you if you do a little bit of searching, you'll see that there is a ton of work out there and a lot of examples on on how to do all of this stuff. Um, if you look at uh, Stack Exchange under their under their uh, you know do R you know query whatever and and pick the uh, uh, Stack Exchange results, you'll find some. Some really good uh, explanations of, of what these algorithms do and some of the problems. But I highly recommend if you're going to do much with uh, much with any of this that you spend some time um, you spend some time familiarizing yourself with the whole the whole data science process. And it's probably not going to come fast unless you can you know take go full time. You know this. Uh, these last nine months were probably 20 or so hours a week, um, something like that. The first month was maybe a little lighter, but a uh, total of nine courses. Um, most of them look very similar. Some are a little shorter. Some are uh, truly there are probably some that are that are better than the uh, than the uh, Johns Hopkins course. Um, they were a little anyway. Well, I'll offer some recommendations, uh, and I'll put that up on, uh, you can check that out on my, uh, my big data site. But if you're interested in this, like I said, this is about three quarters of the way through. So to really understand what's going on here, and I can't claim that I, I know everything about everything here, but I certainly understand what it is they're doing and, and can rationalize why it's being done. Uh, that's that's really very important. You know, you will not be able to drag these things in and build a model. Um, you know, you should you really. I don't want to say you shouldn't try, but uh, you could certainly play around with it. But you you very likely won't get results that you that you're really looking for um, that are really meaningful. You know, simple things like this quantize down here, where we have a uh, you know what's probably a continuous variable that they're um, choosing to push into uh, uh, push into bins. So we have we have uh, some categories. You know, we make it look more like a more like a category than than uh, continuous data. So little things like that are are real gotchas in this whole process. So. Real quick, um, let me back up just a little bit. So, uh, go way back. So we start with uh, real quick run through. 
when I first log into my account on Azure, um, it takes me to to my uh, dashboard, so it shows me what I, you know, all the uh, storage and what I have running. If I had a you know, an HD inside cluster, that would show up here. Um, to get to my uh, machine learning space, um, it's just a simple click here, and it shows me usage. Um, by the way, this is not terribly painful. If it come on. So it should pop up with something here. So this one hour, that's how long it took to actually to run that uh, uh, that whole experiment last night, <clears throat> which is pretty slow. Um, I presume I can speed this up. I have not tried, but that one hour cost me about 40 cents. So it's, it's really not painful at all to do this. The storage I have sitting out there is really not painful either. Um, get back to it. So storage when it just sits idle is free. When you move it around, um, you can move it out of the environment, but moving it into the environment um, costs you money, and moving it around inside the environment will cost you some money. Um, HD Insight is not terribly bad other than um, other than the fact that if you, you're charged by hour for the machine that's running, whether you're using it or not, so it's not compute time um, like it is over here in the, uh, in the machine learning studio. Uh, compute time or run time over in, in uh, HD Insight, you're paying per core per hour. So if you happen to go out and sign up for an account, you'll see that, oh boy, I get a $200 credit, which is good, actually. Um, but it does expire after 30 days, and it also expires when, you, when you've used it all, which you could do pretty quickly if you were to leave an HD Insight environment running. So very important to, uh, uh, to shut your HD Insight environments down. Uh, very important to keep your data out of your, off of your, uh, HD Insight specific storage drives, storage blobs. So everything in HD Insight, you start with a file, it does something to it, and it writes it out to a file. So put those files on some storage that, uh, put them on some storage that uh, you know will be there, um, like these accounts here. I'm paying nothing for any one of these. So keep your data where you can find it. Um, something I talked about. I don't know if you guys are interested. I only have a few minutes here. Um, getting data in, like I said, in our in our machine learning environment, we can use we can use readers to pull data in uh, to either the environment or to then save it in a uh, as a saved data set um, to get it into your Azure storage. Um, you have a little bit of a different issue. Um, you can write that data, I believe you can actually, I'm not sure about this, that you can write your output, I think you, when you're through writer, I believe you can specify any Azure storage blob, um, but otherwise, you know, there are no Microsoft tools to directly move this in. There are third party tools, some of which Microsoft recommends. Uh, there's a Cloudberry uh, 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 Azure Explorer and there is uh, Azure Explorer itself. Um, but that allows you to, uh, they're both uh, browser-based uh, uh, interfaces that allow you to, you know, drag and drop data um, into your storage blobs to get data out where either HD Insight can get a hold of it or whether you can get, you know, so you can get a hold of it from uh, Azure Machine Learning. Um, I think I'm going to stop there and ask, are there, are there questions? I presume there must be a few. Yeah, there are actually quite a few. Ooh. Okay. Um, so an input file doesn't have to be an AARF. They're asking correct. a question. Okay. That's correct. You have, uh, um, you have readers and you have, uh, you can convert your data, um, into any of these formats. So you no, know, it does not have to be AARF. Okay. 
You ready for the next question? Sure. Okay. Can an experiment be copied into your workspace? I was able to do a save as a new name, but it saved it in the original author's workspace. Uh, I don't know. I can't answer that. I don't know for sure. I've not tried. Uh, I've not tried passing those back and forth. Um, I haven't seen anything that would make me think you can. Um, just thinking about this for a minute. I don't. I don't. Uh, back to this guy real quick. I have I have not seen anything that makes me think I could save it somewhere else. It would have to be here as a as a path modification. Um, so I don't I, I don't know. I, I will guess it's very possible at this point in, I don't want to say something on micro, Microsoft's behalf, but remember this is, this is all very new. Um, you know, by their own admission, it is nowhere near complete. So there's a high probability that if that doesn't exist at this point, um, I would expect it would. I'm trying to think if there's any dependencies that would be a, a problem in moving these experiments around. Um, I mean, there shouldn't be other than data. Um, possibly versions, that sort of thing. But so I, I don't, I don't know. I will guess at this point not. Pretty sure not. Let me put it that way. Okay. Um, what can you tell us about elasticity? The building training model will require more resources to establish the model test to establish a model to test them, as compared to regular response from an API, which may be transactional in nature and require much fewer resources. Oh, uh, can you say that again? I think they just want to know about elasticity. <laughs> Question, it's a little confusing. Well, I'm not quite sure. I, I don't know that I'm qualified yeah. to answer that. Okay. Um, and then a couple people, um, just want to know where your blog's located. So if you could show them your blog site. Sure, I can do that. Uh, so let's go to so byheartbigdata.com. That's where you can find me. If you have more questions. And again, if you have anything you want, you know, I'm I'm, as you can tell, somewhat new to this too. I've got a few months on most people, I think, but um, I would love to have, uh, you know, particular, you know, questions or if there's a particular problem you think you'd like to solve, um, hopefully we can find data to do it. Um, you know, not everything is available and certainly a lot of it's not current, but I would be uh, certainly entertaining, you know, working on particular experiments if somebody wants to see something in particular. I um, might be happy to build that out both for my own experience and, and theirs as well. So, um, please throw anything you like in the uh, comments as to uh, the survey at the end of the webinar here. It would be very much appreciated. And or you can contact me at either emreed at iheartbigdata.com or admin at iheartbigdata.com. Either one. I watch them both. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. All right, thank you.